on today's Story Beat. Because when you feel the rhythm of a lyric, it immediately suggests the rhythm of the melody. And then you go with the style or what the content of the song is about in terms of establishing, you know, do I want this to be, you know, what's, what's the feel of it? What's the mood and emotion? And then that'll suggest the musical style. And then you'll shape the melody from that. So yeah, the cleaner the lyric, the easier it is to get started. This is Story Beat with Steve Cuton, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuton. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, Douglas Levine, is a composer, pianist, music director, and educator based right here in Pittsburgh. He's the composer co lyricist of the new musical Claws Out, which was filmed and premiered online in 2020 by City Theater. He's also the composer lyricist of Jazz Time, a new musical filmed and streamed online in 2021 by the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust's Arts Education Department. Douglas's original scores have been premiered by such companies as the Pittsburgh Public Theater, Microscopic Opera Company, The Warhol, The Playhouse Rep Conservatory and Junior Companies, Attack Theater, Pennsylvania Dance Theater, Pittsburgh Classical Theater, Dreams of Hope, Gateway to the Arts, Renaissance City Women's Choir, Pittsburgh Musical Theater, Opera Theater of Pittsburgh, and WQED-FM. Please be sure to stick around at the end of the show because Doug has given us a great treat. We'll hear three of his songs, Not That Kind of Lawyer, Zoe and Jake, and The Mother Age. For the record, Doug and I have worked together on three editions of the Musical Theater Artists of Pittsburgh semi-annual showcase of new songs called Hot Metal Musicals. So for all those reasons and many more, it's such a great pleasure for me to welcome to Storybeat one of the best theater music directors and composers working today and my good friend, Douglas Levine. Doug, welcome to the show. Steve, what a lovely introduction. Well, was, for a lovely fellow. <laughs> it was staggering to hear, to hear that. <laughs> At what point in your life did all of this love of music and composing and playing, where did it start? Yeah, I, you know, I started playing piano as a kid when I was about eight years old. My, my parents, they, they, wheeled, they, asked, they asked my brothers and I, my two brothers, I'm the middle of three boys, if, if we wanted to play. And then they wheeled the neighbor's piano from across the street um, and up the driveway. Literally the, wheeled it across the street? Yeah, this massive upright. Yeah, we were taking the Zimmers upright off of their hands. <laughs> Nobody, no takers over there. And, and that was the piano that I learned of starting when I was about eight. And eventually my, both of my brothers kind of flamed out and, and I, I continued and, and then continued beyond. I, well, clearly. I played, I, I played as a kid and then I played through high school. I got stuck behind the, got stuck behind the piano in junior high for the musical, you know, like uh, Babes in Arms. That was the first show. And I, the truth be told is I really wanted to be, I, you know, I wanted to be on stage with the, I wanted to be singing and dancing and even more so trying to meet those girls, you know, oh, I was yeah. very, shy, very shy. And there were all these cute, cute girls in the, in the, um, the junior high musical, but I was incredibly shy. And the, the, the band director was like, Levain, get behind that piano. I mean, there was no question. You know, I was just, I, I was just behind the piano and I kind of stayed there. Did you play any other, there. did you play any other instruments? Just the piano? I just, just piano. I played, yeah. I played a mean, I played a mean recorder in third grade. A mean recorder. Oh yeah. <laughs> I did. All right. So, so, all right. Did you get training? Did you take lessons? Um, yeah, I had lessons all through um, when I was a kid and all, all through. I had a great teacher and I had trade, I changed teachers in high school and had a great teacher because the, the piano teacher that I switched to as a teenager introduced me to jazz. And that was pivotal. She literally, 
um, bought me a couple of books of transcriptions. As I recall, Brubeck and Oscar Peterson, I could hardly pay, play most of them. You know, they were these wonderful transcriptions, note for note of these famous solos by these two pivotal uh, masters, you know, Dave Brubeck and Oscar Peterson. And she took me, she took me to a couple of concerts, my, my first live jazz concerts as a young teen, you know. Um, in fact, I remember that Oscar Peterson came to Heinz Hall and did a duo piano concert with, with Herbie Hancock. Oh my as goodness. Mem as memory serves, yeah. Um, if you can believe it. And that must have been off the chain. It was off the chain. And of course, Herbie Hancock is a, is a genius and I'm almost sure I have this right. And it would have been, oh my gosh, I mean, it would have been in the early eighties. But of course, Oscar Peterson, I, you know, I, I wouldn't dare say he blew him out. He did not blow him out of the water. Don't quote me on that. Of course, now I'm, now I'm live and recorded <laughs> saying it. But, you know, Oscar. Um, well, he was doing things that were way beyond the average he, mortal. Just their style was very different. And Oscar, I think, was just much more comfortable in a big hall. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe Herbie was having an, I, I, I don't even want to talk more about comparing the two of them. It was an insane show. It was great. And I had my Oscar Peterson book of transcriptions that this teacher had given me. And I went backstage and we were waiting backstage. And eventually Oscar came, came backstage on his way out in his coat. And I kind of got in his face and he, he signed the book and he shook my hand. And I remember shaking Oscar Peterson's hand because his hand was so big. His fingers were like Cuban cigars <laughs> and my hand just disappeared. And that was, that was um that was my high school piano teacher who phyllis dylan shout phyllis. out to phyllis who introduced me to jazz piano and she took me to a G, uh, my my first keith jarrett concert so really so fun. jazz is what then really floated your boat to turn you into a true musician well i guess it's important to mention jazz because most of the writing i do now is focused on musical theater you know i got into college um, and I started as a I started as a business management major. I got into school as a business management major, and I I changed my major to music my sophomore year. And that was a very nervy parents weekend when I told my folks I wanted to do that. You I know? bet, I bet. And uh, I was a very fortunate kid who had a father who was who was footing his bill for college, and, and that, I was very grateful for that. But I had to tell him I didn't want to do business. I wanted, wanted to do music composition. Uh, but my, you know, my folks were very supportive. And the the jazz, I you know, I didn't. I was not doing musical theater writing in college. I was doing, I was doing kind of classical and and letting the jazz influence that. My 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 teachers in college were real classically trained, and my my composition teacher was. Um, was kind of an avant-garde avant-garde guy who kind of encouraged me to do whatever I wanted. But well, but were you were you already thinking about musical theater at that point? I was not. I mean, I, you know, I'd done these musicals in high school as an accompanist, but I I was not. A, you know, I was not like a young guy who fell in love with musical theater. Mm -hmm. um, and and was I was listening to avant-garde stuff when I was learning to write music and classical stuff you know I was listening to the whole western canon um, but it was not musical theater yet I didn't get into musical theater uh till I was till I was into my 20s um and then what happened once you did fall into it was it like love love or did it take a while um yeah, it kind of took a while. I got into musical theater by teaching musical theater. You know, when I when I first started doing musical music professionally, I was in Pittsburgh. I was back in Pittsburgh and I was doing dance music because I remember that I had a job at the time in the Carnegie Museum in Oakland in the development office. I was like working in the fundraising office and in the basement of the Carnegie Museum was the Dance Alloy Studio. Right. That was where Pittsburgh's then preeminent modern dance company, the Dance Alloy, I think is unfortunately no more. But this is back in the late 80s now, I'm right out of college, maybe early 90s, doing this job. And I discovered this modern dance company 
based in the basement of the Carnegie. That's where the studio was. And there was a whole school associated with the Carnegie dance studio down there. And I started playing dance classes. Right. That was my first professional stuff as a musician. So explain to, improvising. Explain, to the, explain to the listeners what playing for a dance class means. What right. Mean? Well, you know, playing for a dance class, they, they taught ballet to kids and adults. They taught modern dance to mostly adults and they taught creative movement to kids. And I was the accompanist. I mean, somehow I just kind of hit the timing <laughs> and I was playing every class eventually. And I did it for about six or seven years. I really fell in love with, with dance. And typically if you go to a dance school, like a ballet school, ballet accompanists will use music. They'll use sheet music. They can, you can get collections of classical stuff that works really well for, for different combinations and different meters, you know, and three, four time and four, four time, different tempos. And you can just play, eventually you could just play the stuff without even looking at the music, but you're playing stuff that's from the classical canon that's either works good for dance or has been written specifically for dance, right. for ballet. But I improvised right from the get-go because I'd had this introduction to jazz, we're coming full circle now, and because I wanted to watch the dancers, I, I never wanted to play from a book. So, and it worked naturally for the modern dance stuff, but I did it for the ballet too. I would watch the teacher give the dancers a combination and I would get a feel, I would get a groove. I would identify what tempo I or what meter I thought it was, three, four, four, four. And I would, I would improvise and I got really good at it. If you, I do you say were, so. Were you improvising off of existing tunes or did you... Or sometimes yeah totally sometimes and that would be a treat you know that would be a treat especially for the ballet like if i would do you know at the end of the ballet class i do like you know over the rainbow as a waltz you know and and, and ballet class is always they're very formulaic um they always finish going across the floor and with a grand waltz often works and i would sometimes throughout the ballet class throw in a familiar tune that i would that I, that I would adapt stylistically to fit the combination. Um, I did that less in modern dance. Modern, I was, I was trying to make stuff up. And, and, and that's sort of where I was, you know, the jazz and the, the composing, you know, my kind of nascent um, chops as a composer were coming together. Um, and I, I, was a, I was a decent accompanist and, I, I, uh, and a decent improviser. And I kind of, figured it out as I went along. Well, I think that this is very instructive. You spent years um, sort of just pounding the keys all day long for people or all evening long or whatever it would be. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was afternoon, a couple of afternoons and evenings a week and all day Saturday. You, you must know? have learned and a ton doing that. I, I learned a ton about dance and I learned a ton about movement and I learned a ton about supporting those gestures. Uh, um, with the music, you know, I really strove to kind of on the fly make these little combinations, these little ditties that I would improvise support the movement. And I got better at it as I went along. I can, I, I, I've got to imagine that you also became a better player from it, just playing a lot. Yeah, yeah, because I was doing a lot of, a, I, yes, correct. I was doing a lot of, a lot of playing, um, but it's a certain kind of improv improvisation that I got really good at. What I wasn't doing was a ton of like jazz. You know, I wasn't going into clubs and playing jazz. I, if, if things had gone a different way, I very well could have, because of course, at that time, there was still a lot of jazz in Pittsburgh. Um, jazz has come back now, you might have noticed, but there was kind of a dead zone for a while there. When I was really getting into musical theater, there was sort of a, Pittsburgh went through a kind of a lull. But I did not fancy myself a really decent jazz player. I, I didn't have the chutzpah to go into jazz clubs and sit in. And I could have, if I would have pushed myself, but it just wasn't the kind of playing I was doing. Um, but I knew enough about jazz and I got good enough reading chord symbols and arranging them on paper that eventually jazz became a part of my language as a composer and a composer for musical theater, you know? so. Jazz is a language that that now 
um, in, informs my writing often as I'm writing for musicals, you know, mm -hmm. something I, I've written a couple of shows that really drew heavily on jazz or I can incorporate if, 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 a, if a song feels like it should lean that way, you know, I'm comfortable using the language, but I never really got comfortable playing with professional jazzers. I've always been fine doing, a, you know, like doing background for an event or, you know, a bar mitzvah <laughs> or, you know, I, so, good so, enough right, so, jazz so, to do so, that. So you were playing for years um, for the for the dancers. At what point did you start to get gigs doing shows, doing theater? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I was really doing exclusively this dance stuff all over the city, but mostly at the Dance Alloy. I started working in a couple other places also. Um, but mostly um, at the Dance Alloy. And then eventually I started working in a school in Mount Lebanon in a suburb of Pittsburgh called the Center for Theater Arts. And that's a school that still exists. Shout out to the Center for Theater Arts. And that was where I did my first musical theater stuff. And it was working with children, working with kids in musical theater classes accompanying you know so i started you know like you learn all the the family theater all the all the kids musicals right you, know, you play oliver and annie out the wazoo you know are you playing this with other uh, other musicians or is this mostly you no accompanying? no musical theater classes for kids and then eventually um music directing shows for kids um, and that eventually led to me writing musicals. And the first musicals that I wrote were with collaborators and they were family theater shows. They were, they were stories geared towards families and children, you know? Right. But that, that was the transition. I went from doing the dance stuff to starting in, in working with kids as a teacher and an accompanist. And then eventually I gave up the dance stuff and was doing musical theater ed um, exclusively. Um, and then that led to a gig at the Playhouse. And that was a pivotal transition for me. So the Pittsburgh Playhouse for the listeners, because uh, there are folks listening to this all over the world and they won't know the Pittsburgh Playhouse. The Pittsburgh right. Playhouse is one of the great institutions in the city of Pittsburgh. It's been around for, I don't know, 70, 80 years. Uh, and it's where many people have gotten their start, including you, apparently. Yeah, inc including me. Right. And I was quote unquote, brought into the playhouse by a director, a guy named Scott Wise, who at the time had been a longtime faculty member in the music theater department at the playhouse. And we collaborated for another company outside of the playhouse. And was the Scott, playhouse under the aegis of Point Park University at that time? Yes, it was. So Scott Wise was teaching at Point right. Park. Point, right. That's right. That's right. Point Park University is the institution we're talking about. And their performance venue was the Playhouse. And the Playhouse, as, as you allude to, had a storied history before their association, even with Point Park. That's right. But eventually Point Park adopted the Playhouse as its main venue. Um, the, the university was located downtown, and that's where the kids did all their classes but the Playhouse was um, a few miles away in the Oakland neighborhood. And the Playhouse had three different venues in it. And, you know, that place was hopping, man. They would, they would never be producing in less than two of them at any one time. And the mm -hmm. dance department used the Playhouse and the theater department. Um, and, and also, just for the record here, just so people know, I, I taught at Point Park for uh, 11 years uh, in, in the cinema school where I taught screenwriting. But you were working for people in the theater school, which is different. Right. Correct. I was working for people in the theater school. And again, I was brought into the Playhouse by this director. And, you know, the way it works a lot, Steve, as you probably know, is when directors take a shine to a music director. Well, they, 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 will, they use you over and over again. They will stick by you. They become very comfortable and they trust you. <laughs> and that worked great for me because Scott Wise, for, for a couple of very specific reasons, Scott Wise typically directed two shows a year. He was a fabulous director and educator, and I was his guy. And I had about a 15-year run at the Playhouse. Wow. Um, and I, didn't, the other, I didn't realize you had that long of a run. Yeah. At, you know, actually, seven, It's well, 15 solid years of, of music directing, most of the stuff they did there, and then, and then sort of here and there. And then eventually kind of not so much, you know, when, when, when I started eventually taking projects 
um, you take a project or two outside of the institution and then somebody else is going to come in mm-hmm. and, then, right. and then sometimes you find yourself, you know, um, moved along you, as they say, you move along. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that's okay. That all worked out. Well, sure. It does. And were you not doing anything else at that time? Were you not working on any other shows? No, I, I, I would, I was working outside of the playhouse. Um, I was, I was always teaching. I was always teaching students at my house, piano students, um, You're talking about ind- individual students. Individual, yeah, and and uh, always trying to maintain a, a, a little private studio. And I would get other gigs outside of Point Park University um, at other professional companies, the small theater companies. And um, you know, the great thing about Pittsburgh is it was big enough culturally that there were there were always a lot of little theaters and quite and a few big theaters, a few. You know, it's not like a big city where there were where there's a lot of both. It it was a big enough pond, and I was a big enough fish in the pond, yet a small enough pond that there weren't a ton of people like me. You know, right. so I I kind of you know I got a I got a decent reputation because I tried to do good work. And man, if I if I look back at my at, at at my resume, there, there were years where I'd occasionally do four, four, four shows in a year, five shows sometimes. And that's possible in Pittsburgh because typically, well, if you're in a university, the run of something is two weeks. And professional companies typically between three at the most five weeks. Right. So if the chips fell and the ducks lined up in the right way, there were years where I'd, I'd, um, I'd managed to do four and sometimes even five shows as a music director. Um, and I've, I was younger too, you know, so occasionally if things overlapped, like if a, if a run overlapped with the rehearsal process, I'd be running around like a, like a nut, you know, I never said no to anything for well, a, probably well, a good I, decade, you know? I, I would say in this, in this particular market, there aren't a ton of people who do what you do. So that makes you in demand. If right, you, right. If you went and lived in New York, you would be less in demand because there are many more of right. you. And 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 it's pointed that you mentioned that, Steve, because there were a couple of junctures where I had friends who were who were moving to New York um, and collaborator, uh, one pivotal collaborator who we could mention, Marcus Stevens. Marcus you know, Stevens. Who I sure. met I met as an undergrad at Point Park, and we wrote a show together while he was an undergrad at Point Park. Wow. And. Marcus, of course, graduated and moved to New York, and and you know, I I thought hard about going. Um, there was actually there was there was actually a weekend when we were in New York together, and we we decided to go into the Lehman Engel BMI writing workshop and right. audition. Right. Marcus was going to audition, and he said, "Why don't you just come with me and accompany me?" you know, while you're here, you help me out and come and accompany me. And we went in there. And of course, Marcus, Marcus um, got in, you know, and they offered me a slot too. And, you know, Marcus said, why don't you just tell them that you're auditioning? You know, we're going to do a song that we're, we're doing, we're doing songs from Eastburn that we just wrote that you wrote, you know, that you wrote the music for. So while you're accompanying me, why don't, why don't we also tell them you're auditioning? And we did. And they offered me a slot too. And I thought hard about it and I turned it down because it would have necessitated (laughs) me driving on a weekly basis for three years from Pittsburgh. And I was already, I was already across the 40 mark. Yeah. Now it's not that I was an old guy, but no, you were, I actually, I actually knew a guy, a talented guy named Jason Call, um, who's a local um, writer and has done a lot of musical theater. He did the BMI workshop driving from Pittsburgh for three years, just like I'm talking about. And I called Jason and I, I said, how'd that go for you? And he's like, it almost killed me. It was exhausting. We, um, we and, should, we know, should and, let, we should let, let, let the listeners know that the BMI Lehman Engel workshop, for those who don't know, is one of the preeminent um, musical theater uh, schools, a sort of, it's like an academy almost where you go in and you work for a, a period of time presenting, developing and presenting new musicals or work, musical work. Correct. And a lot of collaborators meet each other in the workshop and occasionally go on to successful careers together as a writing team. Sure. And so it was a difficult decision. And 
you know, the, the, the main thing is that I was, I was so busy. I, you know, I had stuff on my calendar and I, if, if I'd been, man, you know, like if I'd been 10 years younger, I probably would have figured out, sure. I probably would have done it. You know, I probably would have had the, you know, I, I would have made it happen. Well, and it was you, tough. And when I told them, no, I, 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 of course, you know, I lamented it off and on, you know, over, over the course of time, but I, you know, but I was very busy here. And, and at that point I was writing, you know, that's, that's the thing. And I, it was kind of a, a decision because it made me realize what I wanted to do and that I could do it while I was here. Um, I'm sure if I'd gone to New York, who knows what would have, you know, I would have met and collaborated with different people, but I was, I had projects here, you know, I was getting opportunities to write music for the theater, both incidental scores, um, arranging um, cabaret evenings for, for friends, um, uh, and writing original musicals with, with, um, with different collaborators well, you, that, were, you, that were getting you, produced here. You, know? you sometimes in life need to go where it feels right. And in that case, that's what felt right to you. Yeah. At that time, that's what felt right. And, and it was, and, and, again, that, and, was, that, and that decision was also based on, you knew you were going to be truly challenged in having to go. You weren't going to move to New York. That's what you're saying. You could have made a decision to, to accept and move to New York but you chose to stay in Pittsburgh and that would have required you to travel a lot and you didn't want to do that. Right. It, I just could not see, I could not see doing the drive. And, and at that point I'd really come to realize that, you know, I wasn't going to move to New York and like get a show on Broadway. You know, I had already made the decision at that point that I didn't want to be a, a, a music director. Like I didn't want to be a New York music. I wanted to write and to be, you know, to rise up through the ranks as a music director, that's also a young guy's game, young guy and, and or gal, right. You gotta, you gotta pay your dues in New York city. And there are lots of them there. And that, yeah, especially now, right? I mean, there's sure. tons now. Tons. And I didn't want to do eight shows a week in a pit. That was, that was a, an equally big decision. So I, 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 I didn't want to muse, move to New York and do the kind of schlepping to just try to pay the bills. I was all, you know, at that point, I actually owned a home in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, well, I realized was a place where I had enough work and the cost of living, of course, is going up now. But back then, as a freelance music director, composer and teacher, I bought a home. I bought a little house in Oakland, you know, right, and right. I, that was sort of like a maturing thing, you know, like I timing, right. I mean, I realized this is a city where I can actually have a little house and, and make, make, make my mortgage and, and do what I want to do. Well, there's no question that becoming an adult changes people. <laughs> becoming an adult, Steve. Wow. <laughs> it, it, it happened. I mean, at times I, I wonder if I'm all the way there yet. But. Well, I, I hope you never get all the way there. Frankly, I, I'm not all the way there and I'm a little older than you. and I'm not all the way there. That's, so that's good. I hope you never your, get there. I'm following you, in your, your footsteps. You, you, then, well, I'd be careful about that. You may not want to. <laughs> Got but, you. But, but here's the thing. Uh, it, you've if, if you are doing what Joseph Campbell, the great mythologist used to say, follow your bliss and all else will follow, you were following your bliss. You wanted to write and you felt like it would be freer for you to write here in Pittsburgh than going to New York and be burdened by the, I guess, the, the ordeal of having to, to find work to support yourself in a city like that, which is really difficult unless you are ready to do it and you're passionate about right. it. Yeah, and, and I never... I was going to say, I never regretted this, the decision, but it, it was a double-edged blade that on, on the plus, I had all this opportunity to write that I've, that I've continued to have, you know, mm -hmm. on, on the flip side, one of, one of the biggest goals slash dreams that I've had as a writer and, and as an, as a writer of musicals is to get stuff out of, out of, out of the city, get stuff basically 
get a second production. Well, right? what's I mean, your, and that has been hard to do from Pittsburgh. Well, sure. But what you're saying is true for every city in America. In fact, every city around the world, there's no reason why you can't do what you're talking about doing from Pittsburgh or elsewhere and trying to get it out. And that doesn't mean that you're going to, but there's no reason why you can't do that. Right. And, and, I, and I think that that is that's something that I've come to appreciate, too. I think there was a period when I first made that decision. And I thought, oh, man, I'm never that this feels so right for me to be here. But am I always going to, you know, creatively, is this, am I never going to break out, you know? And yeah, you eventually come to realize, especially with the advent of all this technology, um, and the ability to, to collaborate with people who are in another place. You, you can be anywhere. To, yeah, that you, you could be anywhere as a writer. And, and eventually I really came to realize that, that, that having, having made that solid decision that I didn't want to be in a pit, I, I love music directing, I was great at it, that I didn't want to be in that scene, um, that was what that was what locked it up for me to stay here. And so let, let's and talk. I love, for, and I love it here. Let's talk for a while about uh, music directing and what that what that means. Um, what exactly does a music director do? Right. A music director, um, when the director or who the producer picks the show, you you get the score um, sent to you, which for me has always meant has always meant hard copy. I think now that. You know, you can get a PDF in your email too, and plenty of music directors now use an iPad on Broadway, but um, or in Pittsburgh. But um, you know, I I put the score in a binder, and I start learning it at my piano, and I start marking it up. And you learn the material, and then you show up on the first day of rehearsal, and you teach uh, the notes to the singers, who, if they're professional, they already have a good grasp of that material. Um, and if they're if they're great students, the same. And if they're average students, you're teaching them. <laughs> you know, you're you're hammering it out, measure by measure, um, and you're doing a lot of singing and a lot of playing. And I think for a lot of music directors, that's that, that's really the place where you sing. Period. I mean, for me, that's it. <laughs> and I've told kids over the years, you better delete. You, I better never hear any of that stuff that you're recording on your phone right now. Man. <laughs> All right. So when, when you get the score, it, it, you've already made a decision that you're taking the gig, right? Have you ever turned a gig down for any reason? And you don't need to name names. I'm not looking to, to, to embarrass anybody, but ha has there ever been something that was offered to you and you said, that's not for me? Yeah. I think in the early, in my earlier years, I was just grabbing every opportunity and, and every show that came my way. I'd never done, you know, there's so many shows and as it just happened, I, you took I, the challenge. I have done a couple of shows twice. You know, I actually, um, yeah, I could say that I've done Floyd, I've done Floyd Collins two times and wow. I've done, I've done Chicago a couple of, you know, there's a few shows, but um, I've turned down a couple of things that I didn't want to do again. Usually if I've turned them down, I've had a conflict. And then of course, as you get a little older, if a smaller company offers you something and they can't quite make, they, you know, you're going to have to swallow your pride a little too hard to accept the fee. <laughs> I've turned down things for that reason too, you know. Well, that's a business decision. I'm talking that's about a business a, decision. Talking about an art art decision, whether there's a show that you objected to for some reason. Uh, and I'm not looking for again, I'm not looking for a name. I'm looking for you to say, does that happen where somebody presents you with material and you go, this is not for me? Yeah, I think that that has happened. I think that has happened a couple of times um, where someone has contacted me because they knew of they knew of me or they knew me, but I felt that I wouldn't be right for the material. And once that's you've happened got, a couple of times. And once you've got the material, what's the first thing you do with it? Do you do you play it? Do you look yeah. at it? What, what, I what start I start playing it and. I'm a slow learner, man. I'm a, I'm a good piano player, but it takes me a long time to get a show in my hands. I'm not one of these young prodigies, you know, I can't, <laughs> it takes me, I got to practice everything real under tempo and real methodically and, and over the course of time. So I like a good, I like a good month out front, especially if it's, especially if it's tough playing, if there's and some challenging stuff. And most of the time as a music director, you're not arranging the music as well, or are you? Um, typically, well, you know, there's all, I, I've done all manner of scenarios, you know, um, if you do a published show, typically you are playing notes that are already written 
Um, um, sometimes a published show might have some jazz stuff in it that you're that that welcomes some improvisation. But for the most part, you're playing notes that are written down. And then if you're working with other musicians, they're playing notes that are scored. Um, however, what I have had a lot of opportunities to do is new shows, um, is to music direct brand new musicals and collaborate with composers and orchestrators. Um, and well, you've that done case, that. Well, you did that with hot metal musicals three times, where you take completely brand new songs that pr pretty much no one's ever heard of, and you orchestrated for piano anyway because we don't have more than one instrument but you figure out how that works right like in the case of hot metal musicals which um i don't know if you've ever if you've ever mentioned m tap to your to your listeners but but steve was pivotal with the um musical theater artists of pittsburgh MTAP. the formation of this organ organization that has had some it's a showcase for local writers of musical theater of all different levels and those have been rewarding shows to work on as a music director because I'm being handed scores of all different styles and of all different um, levels, you know, um, of, a, of kind of finesse. And it's been fun for me to work with the writers in some cases and um, take stuff to the to the level of performance, you know, mm -hmm. where it's ready for a for an audience and um, yeah, and I've gotten to do some arranging and and um, a little bit of kind of of orchestrating for those shows. That's been fun, right? And and do you do you when you're working on a, a legitimate show, not you know not a, a one night event like hot metal musicals, when you're working on a show and you're going to have a couple weeks on it, do you ever find yourself needing to do research about the show, or is it pretty much you're just handed the work, here it is, figure it out and play it? Yeah, yeah, yes and no. I mean, um, if it's I have done some research in the past when it's when it's been you know um, when the writer or the content of the show is unfamiliar to me you know when and it certainly helps to kind of um, fill out your awareness of of the setting of the material if it's something set in a in a over around a historical event and and also to listen to more music by the writer. Um, oh, you actually take the time to listen to other pieces that you're not going to play yeah i mean a little bit right i mean I, I i would be disingenuous to say that i you know when i'm when when i did my first candor and ebb show i i went i i went back and listened to every candor and ebb show no come <laughs> um, on <laughs> but um if it's if it's something i haven't done before it's informative you know it's informative to listen to other repertoire by the writer um by those by the writer or the writers mm -hmm. um you as the music in, director you're you're in charge of making the band if there is a band or a mini orchestra or whatever it is it's your job to make them all work together correct correct and after you go through the rehearsal process with the director and the cast um and at the end of that process you are accompanying the show runs of the show r-u-n-s run throughs of the show with just piano from beginning to end in real time. And when the cast is comfortable with that, the orchestra shows up or the band, whatever mm -hmm. the other instrumentation is, if indeed there is other instrumentation. Right. So I've done shows where it's just piano. Um, so it could be anything from just another drummer or another pianist for a forehand piano arrangement up through a quote unquote orchestra. Right. Um, but in Pittsburgh, Typically, I haven't had opportunities to do big ensembles. Um, you know, the place where you get the chance to do the biggest ensemble is if you work with high schools, because the musicians are, you know, they'll fill out sometimes a, a, a full mini orchestra of kids because who, of course, they are need, not getting paid. They, they, need to, they need to give them all that opportunity. Right. But professional um, musical theater is incredibly expensive to produce. And the kinds of companies that I've worked for in Pittsburgh are doing shows that have either small bands, small instrumental ensembles, um, or reduced orchestrations. Um, and that happens a lot. You know, I've worked, um, and you have also worked a few times with a local musical theater producer called Front Porch Theatricals. Correct. And they've done some big, famous musicals 
um, but have used reduced orchestrations of the full Broadway orchestration um, that, you know, which is a trend that has allowed regional producers of musical theater to do those shows because nobody can afford, I mean, even in New York, they can't, you know, I mean, in New York, there's also a trend of reducing the orchestrations. Um, is, but, there, is there a trick that you use in order to make it feel fuller? Um, well, if, the or if, if you're talking about these reduced orchestrations, mm -hmm. the yeah. orchestrator picks and chooses and then does a nice job orchestrating so that it sounds full. Um, if it's a smaller orchestration or band to begin with, it's the job of the orchestrator and then of the performers um, to have a feel for, for, for the score. And if it's well-written, I gotta tell you that um, it doesn't take a whole lot of instrumentation to give the audience the sensation of more instruments, quite honestly, you know. You could even do that as a skilled pianist, you know. If something is really written nicely for the piano, the nice thing about having 10 fingers and, and 88 keys is that you can give an audience, give a listener a sensation of dimension to the music, that the music has a bass, a treble, and a, and a middle. And um, you could really play the piano orchestrally. And I've done a lot of musical theater stuff where the orchestrator is sensitive to that, you know, and, and a small amount of instrumentation can be treated in a way that makes it feel bigger, you know. Well, I've, just, I've, ta I've talked to any number of uh, composers and, and musicians about the notion of the piano itself sort of contains essentially the entire orchestra. Yeah, that's exact. That's exactly exactly what I'm saying. And and you know, if you go to music school, also one way that you can study scores as a as a composer or in a music theory class is you can look at the piano reduction of that score. And and this was huge if you if you go back to the Victorian area before the before the Resteria recordings of Beethoven's Ninth, um, if you know, you, you there were reductions of the famous orchestral pieces of the Western canon, reductions for the piano or for two pianos. And that was often done in concert that way or in a parlor setting. You know, your friends would come over and you and your talented kid sister would play um, a Beethoven symphony that's right. been reduced for four hands, for right. two pianos yeah. or for four or two pianos or or for four hand piano, two Two pianists at one piano is even more typical because not everybody has two pianos in their living room. <laughs> so when you say that the piano has the whole orchestra, it's quite li quite literally the case. And, and um, a lot of composers write from the piano. You, you, compo you compose from the piano. I compose at the piano, right? I'm not somebody... I mean, to an extent, I can hear stuff in my head and then transcribe it, but I've always been most comfortable being at the piano as I write. Um, and, and that goes back to, I guess, my experience improvising in those dance classes, right? The idea, I would just translate these ideas from my brain through my hands, through the piano, and then write. And I'm in good company. You know, probably the best example I could think of is Igor Stravinsky, who, um, you know, there's one, of the, there's one of the greats, and he wrote at the piano as well. Now, of course, there are brilliant composers who who could sit down with manuscript paper, music paper, and and away from the piano and write. You know, I, I always think of that scene in Amadeus where where Mozart's at the billiard table and he's throwing the billiard ball around the around the uh, table, and every time he, he throws the ball, he writes a few notes and then catches them. Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, sure. yeah. Anyway, um, so yeah, Mozart, right? Mozart, I'm not, but then again, neither was Stravinsky. All right, you know? so so when you're composing, um, how do you start? Do you start just by noodling around with the keys, or do you have a thought in your head to start, or where do you, how does this work for you to compose? Yes, and uh, yeah, I do noodle around, and um, although as a young composer um, in 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 college and and. And since I've done a lot of writing that's not musical theater, I've done a lot of writing for piano and, and, and chamber music and, and different stuff. But you know, the, for the most part, what I've done in the last probably 
10 or 15 years has been geared towards musical theater. So often I'm starting from a lyric. You know, if I'm collaborating with somebody, the collaborators that I've worked with, the lyricists, would send me the lyric, right? I've actually never worked with a collaborator from whom they've, they, you know, with whom they've taken the music from me and then set the lyric. Is that um, right? You've never you've never presented music and then had lyrics set to it. I did it a couple times with Marcus. You know this gentleman, Marcus Stevens, who I met as a as a student at right. Point Park, and we wrote this. We wrote a we wrote a musical called Eastburn Avenue. We're going to have a you're going to play a song from Eastburn at the end of the show. Um, this was an important show for me because Eastburn Avenue and my collaboration with Marcus was kind of like the first dramatic show I'd written a bunch of shows with collaborators for family theater and, and, and youth audiences. And this was sort of the first heavy content, you know? And Marcus would send me these lyrics and I, I guess in a couple of cases, he said, send me, send me a melody, you know, send me something and let's try it the other way around. But we, we wrote the show and most of the collab, I, I would say really all the collaborators I've worked with have sent me lyrics and that's the way I've been comfortable doing it. And, and how easy do you find it to take the, those words? Do you ever take the words and, and change the wording so that it fits a rhythm or um, something? Yeah, it depends on the collaborator. You know, Marcus, early on to an extent, I'd do some of that. And, and then eventually he'd be sending me lyrics. You know, we actually did a rewrite of Eastburn some years, five years later, you know, and he was stellar i mean i mean he was talented as a kid you know he, he you should interview marcus sometime and you can get his whole story but we'll, we'll get him on the show for sure you'll get him on the show but I, I guess the point is that the better the lyric is that the more you can see the form of the song in 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 completeness the tighter it is in, in terms of the form verse but, but, chorus whatever what um, but it, but lyrics are a little different than poetry. Poetry can be in a certain rhythm, but it can also be arrhythmic. And, right. And the question for me, uh, when you when someone presents you with words and they're not in a really good song form from from a musical perspective, mm -hmm. do you have to then change the words in order to accommodate it? Right. And I'm glad you said the word rhythm because I was going off there on form, but they work hand in hand you're correct. And what I should say is that you immediately, the form is, it's great if the form is there, if the person sending you the lyric has a strong sense of the shape of this, the architecture of the song. But if they have a strong sense for rhythm, that'll be there as well. Mm -hmm. And you'll feel the scannage, you'll feel the rhythm, you'll feel the way the rhythm is working, um, the poetry of the lyric, the rhymes will be, the rhyme scheme will be clear and correct. And, and clean, I won't have to get up in somebody's grill about their rhymes, which of course <laughs> I've done tons of, yeah. you know? Um, and the collaborators I've worked with who, who have sent me the lyrics that, you know, where you feel the rhythm right away, it's, I don't wanna say it's easy, but it's easy to get started. Cause when you feel the rhythm of a lyric, it immediately suggests the rhythm of a melody. And, then you go with the style or what the content of the song is about in terms of establishing, you know, do I want this to be, you know, what's, what's the feel of it? What's the mood and emotion? And then that'll suggest the musical style. And then you'll shape the melody from that. So yeah, the cleaner the lyric, the easier it is to get started. Um, and then once you're started, then it gets hard, you know, because then you, then you get into the nuts and bolts and you start fussing around with harmony you start fussing around with um, with um, the the accompaniment, and and I, you know, the problem that I've always had is that um, the best metaphor for this is I had a I had a teacher and I had a teacher in grad school who pointed out to me that when I practiced piano and I had the same problem as a composer, I was always arranging the the ashtray on the table before I before I built the house. So, which is to say, <laughs> you gotta get you gotta get a sense of the shape of something if you're writing a song before you start fussing in 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 with one or two beats. You know, I I would get in there and get bogged down in the details of a couple of measures, and hours would go by, and 
I'd be writing from the inside out. And that's something that I still occasionally do. Um, you cannot um, decorate your house before you build the walls. You got you to gotta get the walls, then you put the furniture, and well, you then you can arrange roof, the you ashtray. Gotta, you got to put a roof on first. That, right, right. And, and I would start can... with... I would start with moving the vase and the flowers around <laughs> before the table was solid, let alone the walls in the room. And, and that's always been a challenge and, and an issue for me is that I, I would so get into the nitty gritty before I had the shape to something. And I would eventually get the shape, but it would just take a lot longer. So I've, I've tried, I try to take a step back. And once again, the tighter the lyric is, the easier it is to do that mm -hmm. is to sketch something, to sketch in um, the melody, to get the so, general shape, the general architecture of the harmony, and then to go in and do the nitty gritty arranging. What's the piano going to do here? So you're um, not you're not used to writing a melody, and here's the tune, here's the here's the song, but it doesn't have any words to it. Here, lyricist, you go write the words to it. I have. I've never done that. And, and you so know, now all, all of Jekyll and Hyde was written that way. All of Frank Wildhorn's work is written that way. Yeah. I mean, a chorus line was written that way. Right. Sure. Marvin Hamlish wrote, wrote, the, wrote the tunes. It's amazing. I mean, it really is amazing to me. I, I, I get it. I, I can't. I, you know, I guess it would be an interesting counterpoint to have a conversation with a lyricist uh, because you would hear how they would cope with having the melody first and they'd probably you could probably find lyricists who love that as much as i love having the words first you know how how important do you think uh being a musical director has meant to being a composer and how important has being a composer meant to being a musical music director steve you're you're so good with the questions That's, um it's it's my life <laughs> um it's it's been huge for me and and we could i could pick up a thread i mentioned a guy named scott wise who brought me into the playhouse quote unquote as a music director and the great thing about scott wise is that he was really into new musical theater i mean he had come up and learned and loved the golden age and and all you know all, everything but he loved what was happening now cutting edge you know, and I had never heard of any of that stuff. I, I had never had, I, I did not who, know who Adam Gettle was until my second year at Point Park. And Scott Weiss said, we're doing a show called Floyd Collins. And I'm like, who? Oh. And, <laughs> you know, for your listeners, Adam Gettle, Adam Gettle was a young guy. He happens to be the grandson of, of um, Richard Rogers. Richard Rogers. Yeah. So he had a good he had a good end in the industry that, that, but that that's a fine back background right <laughs> but but um, scott wise loved adam gettle and loved this piece um floyd collins and and the other piece of the puzzle was that this kid named marcus stevens came along and marcus played floyd collins as an undergrad and knocked it out of the park i mean you could still find people who saw that production and remember it it was it was pretty amazing and and I fell in love with this score. I'm like, wow, this guy, because he was using, Floyd Collins is about a guy in, in, in Kentucky who gets stuck in a cave in, in the early 20th century and they never get him out of there. It's a true story. <laughs> um, so there's all kinds of um, mountain music. Uh, there's a lot of really amazing things going in, on in the score, but there's also a lot of intricate, classically based, um, counterpoint and, and and stuff happening that blew my mind adam gettle right check it check it out and of course he the the last big thing that he wrote was light in the piazza which which is kind of um also amazing and, and operatic um opera companies have done that show um but equally amazing technically uh, compositionally right so but, but the point is i i didn't know Adam Gettle, and I didn't know that musical theater writing can be like that. And it blew my mind and it made me think, I, I wanna write musicals. I wanna, I wanna try my hand as a writer. Um, then I did my first Jason Robert Brown show with Scott Wise. I did my first Michael John LaCusa show with Scott Wise, Michael John LaCusa, another really uh, much more known kind of in the business and in New York than, than out because um, his stuff is incredibly deep musically you know um 
Scott Wise and working at the Playhouse exposed me to all of this new writing. And that's what flipped the switch for me as a composer and made me start writing musical theater. So, so being a music director naturally then led you to being a composer. And then how has the composing influenced being a music director? They, they, have, they have kind of informed each other, those skills. Um, so so you're, you're pleased that you are, have both skills. Right. Having the chops as a composer allowed me to start doing arranging for musical theater. I would start to get opportunities to do, I had a lot of opportunities to use musical theater repertoire and do arrangements. Um, there's a fabulous local uh, opera singer who, who eventually got much more into cabaret named Daphne Alderson. And Daphne, over the course of over a decade, gave me the chance to arrange and orchestrate entire shows of, of Edith Piaf, of Rogers and Hammerstein. I got to take the, the, the writing chops and go back into that repertoire as an arranger and eventually even do some orchestra. I mean, recently I worked for a company in Pittsburgh called Quantum Theater, who were producing a brand new musical by um, a, a writer from Pittsburgh, um, uh, Michael Mitnick is his name. Yes. And Michael, we were premiering Michael's show, The Current War. It was the first show coming back from the pandemic. It was, it was the first piece of theater produced in Pittsburgh. Um, so Michael, Michael Mitnick also wrote the movie, The Current War, right. which is different than the musical, but it's the same subject. It's the same characters. But yeah, the, and I can tell that story, but, but it's an amazing story how that happened. And, um, and he also wrote a movie called The Giver that had Jeff Bridges and Meryl Streep in it. And Michael Mitnick is a, obviously a local Pittsburgher as well. Right. Yeah, you should have Michael on. I don't want to. I don't want to tell all of his stories. Yeah, but sure. The, the the short the short of it is that we were premiere. This was the first after the after the Hollywood film, The Current War. He finally had the chance to have The Current War produced as a musical professionally. It had started as a musical when he was in grad school at Yale, but he didn't get his professional music a production of the musical till after the film had happened and the film was not a musical no no the um, film was a straight a straight uh, drama same story but michael did not want to do a musical and, and um harvey weinstein actually liked the idea of having it be a musical harvey weinstein we won't get into that no we won't get into that at all but um uh, but at any rate i guess i i mentioned it because um i had the chance to there there was the money from the lovely producer, Carla Boos, to flesh out the orchestration and add a string. So that's a great example of what you're saying, that, that, that my chops as a composer came back around to musical theater and I got to go in there and orchestrate a cello part um, for, the, for the world premiere of this, of Michael's musical, The Current War, which happened under a huge tent outdoors Everyone because was because, of, because of COVID, it was held because outside. Because of COVID, yeah. Tent. Yeah. Because of COVID, right. I saw it. So those things have gone back and forth my, my whole career, the music direction. Uh, having, the ch having the composition shops have allowed me to bring them to that, um, back into musicals and, and offer those skills to, to producers and to writers, you know, the arranging and the... Um, you know, it doesn't all they're not always looking for those skills but it's nice to have them when they're needed you know you you could say hey let me do that i have been speaking for one hour to um the mu great music uh director and wonderful composer douglas levine and we're gonna slowly wind this thing down a little bit and i'm just wondering you've clearly had tons of experiences you've worked on i don't know uh, hundreds of shows and and various events and in all of your experiences, can you relate to us a story that is either weird, strange, quirky, offbeat, or maybe just plain funny? You know, the th in terms of a funny story, I guess, um, and maybe it has to do with my maybe it has to do with my my self deprecating sense of humor. But i I think of I think of when I was I think of when I was starting out, Steve. I think of when I was young and green, and that's when the real funny stuff happened. And I, I, uh, 
I remember when I was really starting out and I had just bought my first keyboard, my first digital keyboard. And I bought the keyboard because I'd, I'd taken some gigs. I didn't have a keyboard. I bought, <laughs> I bought this keyboard and I, I was going to do a local production of a show called Nonsense. Right. And a lot of your listeners have probably heard of Nonsense. May have seen it. You know, Nonsense has probably had, possibly had, uh, possibly at the very top of the list of all-time produced things. You know, I mean, everybody's done Nonsense, right? So this was my first chance to do Nonsense. And it was a small company like in Wexford, which is a little outside of Pittsburgh. And I was real busy at the time. I probably had a million things going on. And I told them um, for a couple of these performances, I'm going to come screaming in from another gig. I'm going to come screaming in, in my car. I won't be late, but it'll be real tight. And there was one performance of that production of nonsense that was really tight. And I said, look, I'm, I'm going to be coming into this thing. Hold the door. I'm going to come from my car with the keyboard because I'm using the keyboard for this other gig. And I remember I came to this, I came to the, the performance. It was like in this community, like rec room with a, <laughs> I came, you know, I parked my car and I took the keyboard out of the keyboard. Cam. I, I got, I thought I got to save time. I took the keyboard out of the case and I put it on this little luggage dolly that I had at the time. And I'm running across the parking lot and they knew I was coming and they held the door for me. And the whole audience was in there. I, I, I told them this is going to, you're going to have to just hold the house for five minutes and it was more like 15 minutes <laughs> and i came running i didn't even bother to secure the key i'm holding the keyboard with like one hand against this luggage rack you know and i'm a young dude running across the parking lot they hold the door and i get to the entrance of this venue and i hit the lip you know there's like a little lip where the door closed and the the dolly didn't this is a cheap dolly with small wheels and the dolly stopped and the keyboard kept going and I, <laughs> the keyboard <laughs> launched into the air <laughs> and it landed keys down in front of the, the, the place was full of people. It, and it, of course, as soon as it hit the, they saw this thing launch into the air and it smacked keys down and it bounced. I mean, it was horrifying, you know, this big rolling keyboard and the place was silent. And then, and then they watched me walk in and pick the keyboard up and like, amazingly, didn't it, get hurt. It still, it still functioned, but it, it was such a spectacular, it was so Guffman-esque. You, know, you should be doing an ad for rolling keyboards. Uh, I should be doing an ad for rolling keyboard. But it, I don't takes know, a, I mean, it, it takes a licking and keeps on ticking. I, you know, when you thought I'm sitting here at a, I'm sitting here at a, a, my third rolling keyboard, you know, like. Uh, and then that's the first story I thought of. That's very, very funny. All right. So um, last question for today, Doug, um, do you have a solid piece of advice or a tip that you can lend to oh, someone who's maybe just starting out in the business or maybe they're in a little bit and trying to get to that next level? Yeah. I, you know, I have, I have two tips for young Great, composers perfect. and the first, they were both given to me by other people and I took, I took them and they served me well. The, the first tip was, given to me by a composition teacher in college. And he basically said to me, listen to a piece. This is when I was still in school. So I, I had, I could find time to do this. He said, go to the music library and listen to a piece of music every day that you've never heard of. Hmm. You've never heard of either the composer or you've never heard this piece of music by a composer. And if you have, if you're pressed for time, listen to a little piano piece, listen to a little Schoenberg piano piece that takes a minute and a half. And if you have a couple hours, listen to a Mahler symphony you've never heard or a Bruckner symphony. You know, the point is I, I went into the music library for a solid year and I, I tried to do that. And when you're young, you're putting all these sounds into your, your head and you never know how they're going to come out. You know, you never know how they're going to influence you. Sure. And because this teacher was into the avant-garde, I was listening to some crazy stuff I'd never heard of. Uh, and I fell in love with some of these composers. You know, I fell in love with this composer named George Crumb. That was probably my number one. <laughs> I just love this composer named George Crumb, C-R-U-M-B. Mm. If you've never heard of him, go check him out. Wow. Um, I've never he, heard of him. Uh, yeah, actually. And he's collaborated with, with um, his music is often operatic and very theatrical. 
at any rate, that's advice I have to young composers who I think, especially now, it's really easy to fall in love with a genre and to get locked into that genre and to become a specialist in a certain sound and then to be terrified to go beyond that sound. I'm not saying that every young composer is like that, um, but I think that I would have been if I hadn't been given that advice. And so by the time I was in my 20s and starting to write, I was really, really striving to write in different styles and to tackle different genres. Um, and that's influenced the kind of musicals that I like to write and the kind of musical theater that I like to write. I love to write shows where I'm incorporating different styles of music. And I, I attribute that trait to this, to having followed this advice um, of my, well, my, there's no, there's nothing better than broadening your horizon at all levels, broadening your horizons and, and pushing yourself to do so. Because very often when you're starting out, especially if you're writing a show, you might get locked into a style and that, and that, that can be very legit. You could be writing a rock show or even a style of rock, specific rock or, or um, something that's more traditional sounding and you got to write in that style. And that might lead to the next show that's also either in that same style or is going to lock you into a different genre or style. You know, I mean, this can happen if you, especially if you're having success where you could go off in a certain way and that might serve you in good stead. I mean, look, if I'd started writing music that sounded like Disney shows when I was in my twenties, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe I, you know, like maybe I'd be making more money as a writer right now, you know? But anyway, um, I love what's kept me happy as a composer is writing in different styles and different genres. So I offer that advice and I have another small piece of advice. Sure. Um, the other small piece of advice is if you, if you meet somebody who, who you'd like to work with. And for me, it was, for me, it was a theater that I hadn't broken into in Pittsburgh where I wanted to work. Um, somebody said to me, write them a letter. Um, no, a letter. And of course the internet's around, but the advice was a letter, write an it actual, by an hand. Actual, an actual physical letter. Yeah. Write it by hand or at the least on your computer and sign it, but a piece of paper in an envelope with a stamp and think about it. When's the last time you got a personal letter from somebody? I bet there are listeners out there under the age of whatever who've never gotten a pro or who maybe have, haven't sent a whole lot of them. Um, the point is letters make an impression and it's a great way to reach out to somebody and expand your network. Um, it's just a piece of networking advice. And when I followed it, I didn't immediately get a gig at this theater um, because this was a producer director in town who had a music director slash um, composer that he was very comfortable with. It, it's like what I said before, you get very attached to, to, to people, but eventually this guy left town and I got my opportunity and I, and, and this person knew me, knew of me because I'd sent them a letter <laughs> and, and, and it made an impression on them. This person, this producer director was of a certain generation that a letter was a really lovely thing. And that's my advice. Send somebody a letter and then follow it up. Well, that also makes you in this day and age unique. Right. And I think now, being unique is great. Right. And I guess the subtext, so to speak, of that advice is don't be afraid to reach out to somebody. Don't be afraid to network with somebody. Um, it might not be the right time, you might not be ready to work with them, but you can still tell them that you love their work that you saw, you saw something and you loved it, maybe someday. Um, or if it is the right time, you saw something you loved and man, maybe we could go to lunch sometime and talk about collaborating. Don't be shy about your networking, be bold. And um, you never know what could come of it. Well, those are two extraordinary, actually three extraordinarily useful pieces of advice, really powerful pieces of advice, especially uh, listening to other things and broadening your horizons, as well as putting yourself out there. Uh, many people are shy and afraid to do that. And you have to break through that in order to get anywhere, because if people don't know who you are, they're not going to hire you because they don't know you exist. 
So you have to put yourself out there. I think that's that's exceptional advice, uh, Douglas. Um, so as promised, we have a treat. Douglas has lent us three songs that he's written. Not That Kind of Lawyer, Zoe and Jake, <laughs> and The Mother Age. So tell us about those, Doug. What What is Not That Kind of Lawyer? What's that from? Well, Steve, I'm, I'm totally psyched here. Um, I did send these songs to Steve. Um, well, not that lawyer, not that kind of lawyer I sent because I thought maybe in this interview I'd be mentioning Marcus Stevens and Eastburn Avenue and how pivotal a show that was and my learning to write musical theater. And, it and was. indeed you I have. Kind of, kind of hit a new plateau with that show in terms of content. And and and, um, and I strove to rise to the occasion and it took me to a new level. And I picked that, I, you know, we had a few demos from the show, but that one's lovely because it fe features Michael Rupert. Um, I'd had the chance to work and musical direct for Michael Rupert at the Playhouse. Ron Bloom Bloom, the artistic director at the time at the Playhouse, brought in Michael Rupert. Michael Rupert is a storied, if not legendary, Broadway, um, Broadway performer who, mm -hmm. who um, among other things, created the character of Marvin in the original production of Falsettos. And, and um, at any rate, I don't want to go off on those tangents, but I, I met Michael Rupert and Marcus met Michael Rupert. So when we wrote this show and we had this song that we knew Michael Rupert would crush, we asked him to do it. We weren't afraid. And he said yes. And we actually went to New York and we went to Michael Rupert's apartment and he made this demo for us of Not That Kind of Lawyer from Eastburn Avenue. He um, yeah, The song is sung by the uncle in this um, family that's that's going through some struggles right now and the uncle is confronted by the mother uh, the mother pr summarily presents the family with her will and it comes out of the blue and she asks her son the lawyer to take a look at it great okay so what's zoe and jake oh zoe and jake i sent you because i thought maybe we'd get into the chance to, for me to mention that i i've been trying to write lyrics steve and boy is that hard that's a whole nother conversation. Yes, writing lyrics. Boy, I think music's easy compared to writing lyrics. Mm -hmm. I got my 10,000 hours in and as a composer, <laughs> but I don't have them in yet as a lyricist. And Zoe and Jake is from a series of songs that I started to, I just started to write these songs and they're the first lyrics that I ever wrote. They're called, called Songs for Terrific People. And Steve will maybe put my website up on the page and you could find a whole collection of these songs for terrific people on my website. It will, the, the, it will definitely be up on your, on the page. That's great. So these songs were the first lyrics that I ever wrote and they're, they're songs for specific occasions and people. And I took commissions and got a few commissions to write them and wrote a few as gifts as well, including this one. In fact, I'd written, I, I wrote most of them years ago. And this one I wrote very recently for the, uh, I was inspired meeting the kids of a cousin of my wife's. And these kids were so cool that as we were leaving the house, I said, you know what? I, I got a song going in my head about these kids. So um, Zoe and Jake is a song, is the latest, it's kind of an ongoing series called Songs for Terrific People where I was writing words and lyrics. And The Mother Age is a more, is, is a, um, I, I guess the Mother, Mother Age is interesting because the Mother Age is, I think, the first lyric, and it's a recent one, um, but it, it kind of like professional opportunity to write a lyric where I put myself out there as a lyricist composer in a more serious way. And I contributed this song to a um, university production called Songs of Suffrage. And the songs are all about um, the topic of suffrage and, and and the mother age was um, is sung by characters who were famous suffragettes in the movement, singing about an earlier era in history when in certain societies, mothers ruled the roost and, and literally ran society. Um, and so that, who, who's, who's singing on Zoe and Jake? Zoe and Jake. Um, Zoe and Jake is a local singer named Drew Lee Williams, who is absolutely Fat, fabulous great. singer, incredible, fabulous singer. actor, singer, Drew Lee Williams. And the mother age is Marnie Quick, another really wonderful, incredible. 
young singer and she over this was during both of those were done during the pandemic but mother age was early in the pandemic i sent her the score i sent her tracks that i kind of sang badly and i sent her piano tracks that were probably much more interesting and gave her the idea of pitch and she did this thing on her own man she overdubbed all four parts and she sent them back to me and they they were the pitch was great. I didn't have to do any tweaking with the pitch, which you know you can do. I mean, Drew Lee and Marnie, you don't need to fix the pitch. They're great singers. Um, but she said, did such an amazing job of overdubbing herself. So you'll hear four-part harmony and it's all Marnie Quick. Marnie Love Quick her. is gonna be a great big star. D Doug, this has just been a fantastic hour plus here on Story Beat today. I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and sharing all of your wisdom and experience. Um, in theater, in composing, in arranging. And it's just been a great joy. Thank you so much. Steve, thank you so much. Congrats on this amazing archive that, that you've you've been building and continue to build. And I, I was flattered and thrilled to have the chance to talk to you. Thanks again, man. Well, and thank you uh, totally. And, and so here now, please sit back and enjoy Not That Kind of Lawyer, Zoe and Jake, and The Mother Age. The playwriting, Mother, I really think it's harmless. A little deluded, but you would know more about him than I would. What? Well, technically, you already wrote. I'm on a napkin. I know I saw it. An official document? Mom, I value your request. I do, and I've tried to think this through for you. Though I appreciate your offer and always welcome an employer. I'm not that kind of It's not that I'm afraid, I'm not. I've been put into this spot a lot. But with a will that's for your mother, the one you brandished in the foyer, look, I'm not that kind of mom. Yes, I understand you want someone you can trust. And there are plenty of guys who can get it done if you really feel you must. But it's not that. It's what? My marriage. Mom, it's like you read my mind, you do. You can sense it when I stew, so do. Though I should contemplate divorcing, I think it might destroy her. Besides, I'm not that kind of lawyer. I, I know, I know. Don't suppress. Act. And I'm trying hard to act, I just don't know how I feel. And I certainly can't deal with all the responsibility of your last will and testament. I'm a bankruptcy lawyer. But if you really want me to. Mom, the next time I'm in town, I will. We will both look at your will. We will. It doesn't matter if my life's a mess or the talking death I must confess ain't Doesn't matter if I'm not that kind of lawyer. I'm your son. If you have an hour for Zoe and Jake, I'm telling you an hour is all.
We don't have the right to vote, but we used to. We don't have the right to vote, but we used to. We don't have the right to vote. It's waiting silent in our throat. We don't have the right to vote like we used to. Our hard earned pay, but we used to. We don't keep our hard earned pay, but we used to. We don't keep our hard earned pay, but we can watch it drunk away. We don't keep our hard earned pay like we used to. we've come to the end of today's story beat. If you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great story beat episodes to you. Story beat is available on all major podcast apps and platforms, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many others. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden. And may all your stories be unforgettable.